it's good to see you today. You know, I'm totally convinced that, and every bit of my being believes that the best way to live your life is in fellowship with God, and that God is the one who knows best how to do life. And one reason we gather together is that we, we crave the, the deep normalcy that living by God's Word should provide for us. And certainly, if there's a picture of what life is supposed to look like, what normal really is, it's Jesus Christ himself. And so this year, we're going through sayings of Jesus, things Jesus said that will show us what life is about, what matters, how we can modify our lives in order to find that balance and fulfillment that he has for us. Well, this morning, we are going to be looking at a passage in Matthew chapter 25. So if you have a Bible, you can turn over to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to look at the verses beginning with verse 31 um, on through the end of the chapter. It's the, uh, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. You may be familiar with it. You may not be. Um, and I'll, I'll just say right off the bat, this is a perplexing and a difficult passage in some ways, presents some huge theological problems for us as we look at it. And so you'll have to pay attention. We'll try to pull it apart and and make the best sense out of it we can uh, as we look at it this morning. The problem is the difficulty with this passage relates to whether or not salvation, going to heaven, is based on what you believe or is it based on what you do? This is a big division, and in general, it's a division between Christianity and every other faith system. Is Most religions are built on the assumption that you need to do certain things in order to come to God. And Christianity, as we often say, is the story of what he did in order to draw us to him. Now, in the Christian church. This is what divided the church in the, in the 1500s, 1600s, because the, the Western church, the Catholic church, and to a lesser degree, the Eastern Orthodox church as well, was developing more and more traditions that involve things that you have to do. And the Protestant movement, the Reformation, rebelled against that and said, no, it's not about what you do. It's not that you have to be good enough. It's about simply putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so the reformers use the, use the term solo fide, only faith, to define here's what salvation is all about. But People don't agree on that, and it becomes sort of confusing. The problem comes in, in a passage like this, where if you're thinking about that, do people get right with God? Do they go to heaven or hell based on what they believe, or do they do it based on what they do? And when you read this teaching of Jesus, it's easy to understand why some people come to the conclusion of legalism that it really is in the final analysis about what you do, not about what you believe. So what I want you to do, most of us, if I ask for a show of hands, there probably aren't a ton of legalists here who say, yep, it is about what you do. Some of us live like that to one degree or another, but we won't say that we believe that. But just as I read this passage, I want you to put yourself in the place of someone who believes that salvation comes by works, not just by faith, and see how you hear this passage, because I want you to understand why this is a difficulty and why there are vast segments of the church that are still hung up on works as opposed to faith. So we'll begin reading chapter 25, verses 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, this is Jesus speaking, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he'll set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. 
Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and we came to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you didn't give me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. They also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And didn't minister to you. And he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Do you see the problem? Here's Jesus at the judgment. He's going, I am going to tell you who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. The ones on my right side, go to heaven. The ones on my left side, go to hell. And here's how we determine it. How did you do when it came to feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, housing the homeless, visiting people who are in prison? And he says, that's how I'll decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. (coughs) Well, we go, whoa. Now, wait a minute, is that Jesus? Are you sure? Does that really make sense? Because, and it presents a problem in two ways. First of all, there are some people who believe in Jesus who have never visited someone in prison or who have never fed somebody who was hungry or clothed someone who was naked. Now, if you go, no, no, if, you, if you're really a Christian, you would certainly do at least some of that in at least some sort of way. But think about the thief on the cross. Remember Jesus was hanging there on the cross. There's a guy hanging next to him. And the guy just all of a sudden has a change of heart. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, sorry, you've never fed hungry people. There's no way, you know, unless you can come up with some good works that you can do right now, there's no way that you're going to heaven. No, he he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So there are certainly, it's possible to have faith without doing these kinds of things. But the even more perplexing dilemma is there are some people who, you know, house the homeless, who feed the hungry, who clothe the naked, who visit the prisons, and they don't have faith in Jesus Christ at all. So this presents a problem in both directions. You take people, for instance, who are very sincere and well-meaning followers of Buddhism, who they do good works, never mind why they do it. They may be feeling it brings good karma, and in their next life something good's going to happen. But wouldn't it be the case that we would go, you guys are in because you're doing these good things. So do we believe that someone gets saved based on what they do, in which case, what do you need Jesus for? All you need to do is get a crusade going to get people, to help people who can't help themselves, and then we're done. See the problem? It's difficult. Now, already those of you who have good theology, are coming up with a way to twist this so that it's not a problem anymore. And first thing we go to is, wait, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of works. Well, for one thing, Paul hadn't written Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 yet when Jesus spoke this. And we don't want a good lesson of what we call biblical hermeneutics, that's the study of figuring out what the Bible means, interpreting the Bible. A good principle is don't be too quick to interpret the Bible based on bringing a bunch of other Bible passages into it. That's an easy way to do it. Bad teaching almost always can't teach a passage of Scripture without 20 cross-references. Sometimes you hear people teach and they're like, well, over in this passage it says this and over in this passage and, you know, your finger wears out trying to flip back and forth like they're putting together this jigsaw puzzle. But good hermeneutics says that what's written in the scriptures means what it meant to the one who was writing it when they were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That is, in this case, This meant what Jesus intended it to mean at the time that he said it. This meant what it meant by the listeners at the time who heard him saying it. This meant what it meant when Matthew wrote this down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and recorded it here. Now, the problem with interpreting the Bible in light of our other theology is it becomes circular reasoning. Do you see how this could happen? If I say, no, I already know from another verse this, so I'm going to use Ephesians in order to interpret Matthew, well, how do I know that I'm interpreting the passage in Ephesians correctly? How do I I understand that? Am Am I just saying, well, theology says this, And I go, well, wait, where'd you get your theology? Well, from a bunch of different passages who I'm interpreting in a certain way. See, a good student of the Bible will look at a passage of the Bible and try to ascertain what does this mean even if I don't have all the other passages because when Jesus gave this message, there was no New Testament. So what does it mean? And what we do in order to interpret the Bible is we need to look carefully at its grammar. We need to look at it in a historical context. But the number one rule of biblical hermeneutics is you need to take a passage in its context and within the context begin to discover, oh, that makes sense. I see that's what he's talking about. So, you know, don't rush off and just give up and become a you know, a Catholic, because it's like, oh, oh, there it is, it's pretty plain. But if that happens, that's totally fine, as long as you feel like this is really what Jesus is saying. But to understand what Jesus is saying, we need to take a look at it closer in its context. And so the context of this is important. That's like, okay, what else was he saying? Now, the context of this passage is... The larger context, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 are all one message that Jesus gave that's called the Olivet Discourse. It was a sermon that he gave on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples. Now, if you turn over to to Matthew 24, the disciples were raving about how beautiful the temple was. When you're on the Mount of Olives, you look over there and it's still an impressive structure. But even then, it was not only the walls of the city and the glory of looking down on that, but it it was the temple itself in all of its glory. And as they were saying, man, that's amazing, Jesus said to them, day is going to come when it's just knocked down and there won't be one stone left on another. And the disciples asked him, so when's this going to happen and what are the signs that it's going to happen? So they're asking about the future of Jerusalem, asking about the future of the Jewish system, asking about the future of that land. And so in that context, Jesus begins to talk to them about the signs of the times. So the first thing he does is let them know it's not going to end a lot of times when people think it is because there's going to be all kinds of wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of stuff happening 
And that won't necessarily be the end. But he, he begins to develop a time when things get worse and worse. And then in verse 15, down through verse 28, he talks about this period of time called the tribulation or the great tribulation. It's a time that they would have known about because of the prophet Daniel, because of other passages in the minor prophets, so it's fair to bring that in. And he's saying what had been said before, the time is going to come when there is a ruler who takes over and begins to run the world, basically. But what he's going to do in, during what he calls, Jesus calls here in verse 15, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. So they know, oh, Daniel. And Daniel prophesies a time when this, this beast, this antichrist, is someone who comes into the temple, turns on the Jewish people after having a time of peace, he turns on them and he desecrates the holiest place in the temple, probably by sacrificing a pig. Antiochus Epiphanes had done that before, but Jesus is talking yet future that this is going to happen. And then as you read down through these verses, he's going to say, if you are in Jerusalem, if you're in Judea, head for the mountains when this happens. When this event happens, get out of town. Now, in 70 AD, when Titus and the Romans came in and, and destroyed the temple and desecrated the holy place, it would have been natural for people to have said, oh, this is, this is what he was talking about. But you'll see at the end of it all, something happens that hadn't happened yet. But this is a time of horrible devastation called the tribulation period. And it says, Jesus says, it would have killed everyone if it wasn't just such a short period of time. So this is our context. Now, at the end of this tribulation period, what Daniel call, you know, calls the last of the seven days, the seven, 70th week of Daniel, now it says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon won't give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, powers of the heavens will be shaken, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll send his angels the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one into heaven to the other. So again, Jesus is explaining there's going to be a bunch of war, but then there's going to be this ruler that comes up. There's going to be awful devastation, persecution against anyone who believes in God and, and, and in a true way. And then when it's about to fall apart, the Son of Man is going to show up, appear. He's going to come there to Jerusalem and set up his reign. So we're seeing his coming at the end of this tribulation period. Now he, again, to ex explain it, he goes into several parables. The parable of the fig tree, which says, you can tell, you don't know when this is going to happen. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but you can watch events going on that will let you know you're getting closer. And then he has the... Um, the faithful servant and the evil servant down in verses 45 and following the rest of chapter 24 to warn you, don't be one of those guys who thinks that, ah, he's not coming anytime soon. You need to be ready. And then going into chapter 25, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins with whether or not they had oil in their lamps, and he's like, see, you need to be ready. And then finally, the parable of the talents great parable that talks about being responsible with an opportunity that the master has given you, using it well because he's coming back someday and he's going to hold you accountable for whether or not you used that which he had committed to you. Okay, then we come to this judgment of the sheep and goats. So, what Jesus is talking about is not just you know, on the surface, it's like, wow, it sounds like he's saying heaven and hell depends on whether or not you take care of people who can't take care of themselves. But 
what he's doing is talking about a specific period of time and a specific place and a specific event and a specific judgment. This is not the great white throne judgment that happens later where all the dead people come back and they all have to answer for themselves. This is just of people who are alive at the end of the tribulation period. It's also not the Bema Seat judgment where believers like us are judged according to the rewards that we get for the things that we've done. This is a judgment at the end of the tribulation period. Now, a couple of things to connect here that are important in order to get that is notice in, in uh, chapter 25, verse 31, where he talks about the Son of Man coming in his glory and all the holy angels with him, sitting on the throne of his glory and the nations being gathered together, is a parallel with in chapter 24, beginning with verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll send his angels to gather together his elect from the four winds. So what we see is here in chapter 25, he's taking us back to the event that he's describing in chapter 24, this time when he shows up, when his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, and now he has come and has destroyed evil, has has devastated the devil, has made it really clear that he is the Lord and he is there and to be seated on his throne. So that's when this judgment takes place. And that's what he's talking about. One other detail that I want to point out to you is that in chapter 25 and verse 40, it was how you treat his brothers, the least of these my brethren. That's a key, that's a key phrase that he uses here. So now that's basically our introduction. <laughs> and are you with me so far, more or less? First service, I asked that, and somebody goes, no. <laughs> Sorry. It's the best I can do in the time that I have. But now taking us to this time that Jesus predicts, that Daniel had predicted, that the Apostle John wrote about this time of great tribulation or trouble, knowing what goes on there, I have to ask, you know, what would that time be like? I mean, the Antichrist sets up, first of all, he's buddy buddies with the Jews, but then, boom, he snaps, and he totally turns on the Jews because he's upset, probably, that Jews are refusing to worship him, and instead they are coming to faith in the Messiah, the scriptures tell us in multiple places of how many people during this time are going to be saved, and that's really the point. The whole point of what Daniel was prophesying is that the Lord would bring his people to receive his son, his Messiah. And the Antichrist just goes ballistic. And so he completely defiles everything that's holy to the Jews. He turns on them, and he basically sees Jews and Christians as being the same. And they all need to go. And so he sets up a system, an economic system, whereby if you don't worship him, you, you know, if you don't take his mark, buy into his system, now you can't get a job, you can't buy basic supplies, you can't buy food, you can't buy and sell anything. He basically completely ostracizes anyone who won't worship him, which would be the people who are following Jesus Christ. The Jews, there are at least 144,000 of them. Moses and Elijah show up and preach. Lots of people are converted. You have this mass of people, and he eliminates them, essentially, by making it impossible for them to live. Now, you know, let's face it, though. When Jesus finally comes, you know, Who's going to believe him? If, if you're going to say, what you need to do is believe that Jesus is the Lord, what kind of a judgment would that be? Who is going to know that Jesus is Lord when he comes back, destroys Satan, blows up the whole economic system, destroys the whole religious system, kills the armies of the enemy, and he sat on his throne, put yourself in that place, who's going to go... 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I believe in you. Really? I'm sitting on my throne. I just killed everyone who's fighting against me. Are you nuts? The Bible tells us every knee will bow at that point. But what makes that tricky is, how do you know who has put actual faith in Jesus Christ? How will you decide at that point? Now, again, almost everyone, there may be a few nuts. You know, there's people today that believe we haven't landed on the moon. Some people think OJ is innocent still. But, you know, so there are probably going to be a few people like, I don't care. I see you on your throne. I think this is an illusion. This is the matrix or something. But most people would go, wow, you win. But his desire is to have people who have genuinely put their faith in him when they had an option. Isn't that what the whole history of mankind is all about? That Jesus, God didn't want robots, so he puts us in life and he gives us an opportunity to decide for ourselves what we want to believe. So how could you find the people at this time who believe in Jesus Christ while they still had a choice. And I would suggest to you that this judgment of the sheep and goats is about him sorting out the people who are really believers from the people who aren't. Now think about it. If you are living in a society whereby to deny Jesus Christ and to worship the Antichrist is really the only way to thrive. Who is it who isn't going to take the mark? Who is it who's going to go, I don't care if you starve me, I don't care if you cut my head off, no mark for me. Who does that? Maybe a few wackos from Montana or something, but then for the most part, it's going to be people who have a genuine faith in Jesus Christ, right? Because what in the world incentive would they have to not do that? So you're going to have people who are isolated, who are being treated horribly. They're trying to wipe them out. How in the world did they even survive to the second coming? Well, obviously, they helped each other. They chipped in together. When one person managed to scrounge up some food, somebody else didn't have it, they shared with them. What a bold commitment to what you believe to be able to say, I can have my head cut off for doing this, but one of my brothers is in prison and I'm going to go take him something to eat. I'm going to go pray with him. One of my brothers doesn't have clothes. I have two sets of clothes and he doesn't have any. I am going to share with him. There may be some wackos who don't want the mark, but they're going to hoard what they have. I can't think of another reason why people during this time would share with others, help others who can't help themselves, if they didn't have a genuine commitment, a genuine faith commitment to Jesus Christ. And this situation becomes desperate. This situation becomes deadly And now the question is, who really believes? Looking at whether or not they help others would be a foolproof way of discovering that. It shows what your faith really is. And this isn't completely unprecedented. Um, There are people who, for instance, during Nazi Germany, who laid their lives on the line in order to protect the lives of Jewish people. Why would you do that? Knowing that it could kill you, why would you do that? And interestingly, most of the people who protected the Jewish people were Christians, which was a stunning revelation to the Jews because they thought it was the Christians who were persecuting them. Adolf Hitler claimed to be a Christian. 
Adolf Hitler was a member in good standing of the Roman Catholic Church, and not only that, with all the people that the Roman Catholic Church excommunicates, do you know that to this day they have never excommunicated Adolf Hitler? So for Jews, that's why they have a hard time with Christians, because everything that happened to them happened because of the fact that they think Christians hate them. And yet, who was it who came to their defense? It was people like Corey Ten Boom and her family, who because of a deep commitment to Jesus Christ, risked their own safety, risked their own lives. Listen, it wasn't just Jews who were put into the concentration camps, it was even Christians who weren't Jews who were helping Jews. So they're in this situation where it's like, man, this is a mess. And so you're forced to ask yourself, how do we survive? Why would I survive? In what way would taking that risk make sense? And the only answer would be because you have faith in Jesus Christ. So at this time, it would be pretty easy to find who has the real faith. You just go, you guys, I saw you and how you treated my brothers. And when you were treating them that way, you were treating me that way. Welcome to heaven. Welcome into my kingdom. Now, again, this might not be an accurate way of dividing people today. There's nothing, when we read about the great, great white throne judgment, when we read about the Bema seat judgment, there's nothing about this. But in this particular time, in history, this will be an absolutely faithful way of ascertaining who really believes. <laughs> it's easy to say you believe, but what are you willing to suffer for? What kind of risks are we willing to take? It would be wise for us to ask ourselves, if we're in this situation where we have to choose doing what God says and taking care of his people or death. What are we going to do? What would you do in that circumstance? Because that shows the kind of faith that he demands. It's why Jesus said, you want to follow me? Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Because it is a serious level of a commitment. Now today, we're not in that situation. So you have to look in your own heart and see what kind of commitment that you've made to Jesus Christ. But in those days, that will be a very effective way of ascertaining the believers from the non-believers. Because you either do it and risk your life, or you deny it and you take the mark of the beast, you look out for yourself, and you're on the wrong side when it comes to the judgment. So, does that kind of make sense? Now, we have to then ask ourselves, how do we apply this? What does this have to do with our lives? You're saying that this is something that's in the future. You're saying that this is something that isn't applying to us today. I, and you're right. I don't believe that we are going to be alive during the tribulation period if we've trusted in Jesus Christ before that. I believe that the rapture will take us out before that happens. So my conviction from Scripture is that 1 Thessalonians 4 is going to happen and we're going to be caught up to be with the Lord. But I could be wrong. So first of all, if we find ourselves in this situation, you know what you need to do. Now maybe some of you haven't even put your faith in Jesus Christ. If some guy is ruling the world and he's defiling the temple and he's killing everyone who won't take a mark, listen, <laughs> The only way for you to survive for eternity, if you find yourself in that situation, is to choose to risk your life and to maybe give your life to help others, to help them in a way that they can't help themselves. That's your only way out of this. So I just want you to know that. But for most of us, I don't believe we're going to be there. So how does this apply to us? Well, I think it does in several different levels. One thing I think it's really important for us to consider is God's heart is still for Israel. 
God cares about those people, even though most of them are atheists, even though most of them haven't come to him, the truth is the reason for the tribulation period is for God to destroy the enemy and to draw his people to himself, and it works. People, Jews are getting saved right and left during that time because they realize, wow, he is the Messiah. And so through the testimony of lots of witnesses and everything, they are coming to Christ. But today, maybe you don't see that in a huge way. There's probably in a room this size, there's a few of you who are Jewish. But understand that his heart is for the Jews, for Israel. All of his prophecies point in that direction. You cannot be faithful to what Christianity is all about and be anti-Semitic. But even beyond that, you know, he, well, back in the time of Abraham, he said, I'm going to bless people who bless you and I'm going to curse people who curse you. He said, Israel is the apple of my eye. Today, who is it that stands behind the people of Israel? It's almost exclusively people who have followed Jesus Christ. The rest of the world is lined up against them. They're fed up with them. They, it's just like, man, this little piece of land that doesn't even have oil on it, what are we fighting over? And you know, notice every, when we, we say that we're, um, we probably aren't going to do it, but when we say we're going to you know, go bomb Syria because they used chemical weapons against their own people, that's a horrible thing to have done. But what does Syria do? If you do that, we're going to bomb Israel. And Iran goes, yeah, us too. Iraq, us too. The Russians and, and uh, the Chinese are like, and we'll just stay out of it completely. Why is that? They aren't the ones who are causing this. They won't be the ones most likely who attack. But they hate Israel. And I think it's just important for us to understand that those people as a nation, God has a heart for them. If you're more of a New Testament person and you're like, you know, Paul is my hero. And he was Jewish, but he went to the Gentiles. Their day is up. Now we're into Christianity. Paul said in Romans, I love my people according to the flesh. I love Jewish people so much that he said, I would go to hell if it meant they could go to heaven. So we need to think pretty clearly and seriously about how much our heart is aligned with his brethren. Because he says, you do it to them, you're doing it to me. And that's important. But you also can't escape the fact that Jesus identifies with people who can't help themselves. And he identifies himself with people who help people who can't help themselves. And so I think it's, it's fair in a general way to say, if you can clothe people who are naked, if you can feed people who are hungry, give water to those who are thirsty, if you can visit people who are in prison, if you can provide housing for people who are homeless, that you're getting close to an opportunity to do something for Jesus. Jesus identifies with his people and he says things like, hey, if you love me, love my people, feed my sheep. Now, this doesn't mean that we have an obligation to house everyone or to feed everyone. And, it, and it, the Bible says to be, to be good to everyone, but especially to the household of faith. So we have a, um, a greater responsibility to God's people. But it's also, these are people who legitimately have no other choice. We're not just to feed everyone who wants food, who's asking for food. I, I've had experiences both here and at Costa Mesa when somebody came in for, for food, and we had food there, and they start going, uh, I don't like that, I'm kind of lactose intolerant, that doesn't work, my kids don't like that. Do you have any? And they think they're shopping at Costco. Now, what that tells you is, you're not that hungry. If someone is rejecting what you're giving because they don't like it, 
That's not who he's talking about. These are people who will die if somebody doesn't give them something. And, and we should really look to focus our attention in that way. Some people who claim they're hungry, it's just that they're so addicted to food. You can look at them and know they're not very hungry. That hasn't happened that long. But that's not what he's talking about. And he's not talking about, you know, the, the New Testament, Paul tells us, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So in all these things, we need to temper it with People need to, if they have an opportunity to help themselves, don't help them. But when you find people who don't have a way of helping themselves, then Jesus would say, you are identifying as one of mine when you do this. Now, we also have to look at it and go, yeah, but this is God's people, right? I mean, these are his brethren, so... We shouldn't really visit people in prison who aren't Christians, shouldn't really feed those. Well, here's the thing. How do you know whether or not they are really your brethren and they just haven't discovered it yet? How do you know that through your showing compassion to them that they may even be drawn into a relationship with him? And so we want to do things for people who can't help themselves whether or not they know Jesus because this testimony is something that may draw them into a relationship with him. And that's really important. It's, it's not encouraging irresponsibility, but it's realizing that maybe what we have when we share it opens a door for people to discover a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I think too that that um, we all ought to look at our, our lives and go, what am I sacrificing, really? If I'm only doing and giving and serving in a way that's really comfortable for me, if I hear, oh, here's something that I could do for someone, and, you know, they need clothes, and I got clothes I don't even like here. But the faith that he's talking about is a faith that will, as Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So do we do that? Is there even any way in which anything that we do is making us even slightly uncomfortable? That's something that should give us pause because someday it's going to be really clear. Those who are risking their lives have a genuine faith. Those who are not willing to risk their lives don't have a genuine faith. So what if he applies that same test to us today? And he says, what is the level of your commitment? It's, it's pretty easy just to go, okay, you can choose Jesus for free. It's not going to change your life at all. Or you can choose to ignore him and take that chance, but come on, you must please come. <laughs> no, it's, it's not that simple. A faith in Jesus Christ is something that has an, an effect on our lives. And this is something that we need to look deep inside ourselves and ask ourselves, how deep is my commitment? How real is my relationship? And, and then finally, there might be some of you here who have never actually entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that you know, you're like, yeah, I'm okay with it. Not really ready to make a commitment one way or the other. Well, first of all, I want to tell you, like I said before, if this stuff starts going down, you know what to do. But what makes you think that if you will not accept Jesus Christ now, that when you're going to get your head chopped off for doing it, that you're going to do it? Really? You think that that's going to change things that much for you? How much do you need to see? Now, the truth is, he has a heart for you, and he loves you. But this is a very serious passage for you. Look at the last verse, verse 46. These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And back up in verse 41, he explains the punishment a little more as he says, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So Jesus, the guy that you're like, yeah, he's a good teacher, he's good, that's fine. He is telling you that your future 
is either to be eternally alive or to be eternally dying. There's no other way around it. And if you go, well, I mean, do you really think that hell is for eternal, eternity? Well, the same word that's used in the Greek that's translated everlasting and then it's translated eternal in verse 46, the exact same word. So however long you think heaven is, that's how long hell is. You really want to mess with that? Do you really want to go, well, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I'll play it by ear. When I get a little older, maybe I'll do this. I just want to make it really clear for you. There is an outcome to what we do with the lives that he gives us. And eternity is on the line for all of us. And it's so simple right now for you to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, to be saved, to have your sins forgiven, your life start over, your eternity to be secure. And all you have to do is trust him. He's not asking a whole lot of you right now, but it's critical that you know where you stand with God. And I just want to invite you, if you haven't done that, if you're not sure, please lock it in today. There'll be people down in the front who would just love to pray with you and introduce you to Jesus Christ. You can become a part of the brotherhood that when push comes to shove, we're there for each other. We are locked in. Our eternities are, are set. Your sins are forgiven. And though we may see lots of pain in this life, we have an eternity of bliss and blessing waiting for us because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. It would be absolutely foolish for you to take a chance on turning down his offer for what? What is it that's more important to you than your eternity? But if that's you, come down after the service. People down here would love to pray with you and help you to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, I think we need to think seriously about what faith in Jesus actually looks like when it comes to our daily choices, when it comes to what we do with our resources, what we do with our time, how we treat others, how we look for people who are truly helpless so that we can help them. It's a great challenge from Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It convicts us and it encourages us all at the same time. I pray that you would help each of us to have a burning heart because we know what's going to happen. And we have an opportunity to save people from having to go through that horrible time and to be in that dilemma. So help us to believe what you say, to change our lives as a result, to be effective representatives of you as the one who identifies with those who are down and out, those who are helpless. Help us to work with you to do the things that you tell us are the things that matter in the long run. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's awesome.